Hey guys, can you hear me? <laughs> Somebody type in the question box if you can hear me. Awesome, thanks. At least Brandon and Hillary can hear me and Chris as well. Very good, very good. And can you see my screen? Can you see the presentation? I'm always very concerned about this stuff. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so it is 7.01, so I guess I'll get started. Um, let me make sure I'm recording this. Hold on a second. Yes, I am recording. Good deal. Okay, so um, first of all, thanks for joining. Um, I am happy to see you guys here. Um, we are recording this, so if you want to watch it again or if you missed it, you can uh, listen listen on in later. Um, I'm going to talk a bit tonight about nutrition and the athlete's immune system. Um, when I put together this presentation and had this idea, coronavirus wasn't even a thing, so now it's kind of relevant uh, that we have sort of a pandemic going on in our world. Um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, this is always a timely topic this time of year, really any time of year for athletes, but especially during this cold and flu season. Um, you know, how basically is the best way or what are the things that we can do to stay healthy um, when we're training hard? We don't want to miss, uh, we don't want to miss training time. We don't want to miss time away from our families and jobs and everything like that. Getting sick is a royal pain in the butt. So, um, so tonight I'm going to just spend a little bit of time talking about what you can do from a nutrition perspective, as well as just what you can do from other perspectives, just some reminders, a lot of things that people already know, but just some reminders about what you can do, um, to stay as healthy as possible. So, um, I will keep my, my eye on the question box. So if you see, there is like a little question box. So if you have any questions, type them in there. I'll keep my eye on that during the presentation, but I'll definitely look at it at the end. Um, so hang in there if I'm not answering your question right away. I will definitely get to it. So, Okay, so nutrition in the athlete's immune system. All right, so tonight, what are we gonna talk about? Um, First of all, what are the risk factors for upper respiratory infection? So primarily we're talking about cold, flu, coronavirus, <laughs> things, things of that nature. Um, what are the risk factors? And here's a little preview hint. Um, everybody on this, this webinar listening to this likely has a risk factor because you are an athlete training. Um, what are some general nutrition strategies that you can um, you know, kind of keep in mind to keep healthy? Um, and again, nothing earth shattering, but it's always very good to be reminded of these things. Um, and then what are some nutritional supplements to consider? Um, I'm gonna talk specifically about probiotics, D3, vitamin C, um, and zinc lozenges. Um, these are the four supplements that have strong to moderate strong support in the literature. So you'll see a you know, a ton of different supplements out there that um, report, you know, claim that they will help with immune function. Um, there's a lot of others that have been studied quite a bit, um, but they, they have less um, compelling research to back up the thought that they are of any use for immune health. Um, in particular, glutamine, omega-3 fatty acids, those those are some supplements that have been studied quite um, widely for immune function, um, and they don't really have that strong of, a, of, a, of research backup. So the ones we're going to talk about today are the four that are, have very strong support. Um, not to say that glutamine and omega-3 fatty acids aren't useful in other situations and for other things. Omega-3 fatty acids are my favorite supplement, <laughs> just not for immune health. So. Um, know that the four we're going to talk about are the four that have the strongest support. And then we'll talk about some other training and lifestyle strategies that will just help you stay healthy. So help you make sure you don't get the coronavirus. <laughs> um, 
somebody's going to listen to this presentation in like three years and be like, what's the coronavirus? <laughs> okay, so risk factors for upper respiratory infections. Um, so number one, prolonged heavy exertion. That's pretty much all of us. If you do any sort of training, um, you know, anything that, you know, you get on your bike for two hours, you, you know, run an hour and a half, anything like that is definitely going to put you, obviously, it's going to have a lot of health benefits, but it also puts you at risk for upper respiratory infection because it obviously is a stress to the body. Um, restricted sleep, there's number two. That's, that's just about every athlete as well because we're all trying to work and uh you know take care of our families and you know train on the side and you know still remain friends and still remain married and things like that so um oftentimes sleep gets um you know gets sacrificed and so that that's obviously a big risk factor for getting sick as well um travel air travel in particular so airplanes are <laughs> airplanes are a cesspool for infection um exposure to sick poor uh sick people and poor hygiene that's an obvious one um obviously a lot of us can't help that if you're in some kind of um you know job or some kind of situation where you have a lot of exposure to the public um you're just at higher risk I luckily work from home and my dog and I are the only ones that ever interact. So I, I, I'm i good on that one. I'm kind of not good on all the other risk factors though. Um, psychological stress. So really any kind of life stress, um, depression, anxiety, um, you know, just the average uh, life is stressing me out right now. Again, puts you at risk. So any kind of stress on the body, life stress is probably a bigger factor for, for people um, more so than they think. Um, low energy availability. So anybody honestly trying to lose weight, cutting back on calories, um, people just simply not fueling enough. Um, that's another big risk factor. And obviously time of year. So fall and winter are the common cold and flu season, definitely higher risk at those times. So um, you're, you probably have at least one, if not all of these. Um, so just uh, just pay attention here to what you can do to help your chances. Um, okay, so let's talk about some general nutrition strategies. So like, what can we do with our general diet? Um, eat a well-balanced diet, <laughs> that's not surprising, with a focus on fruit and vegetable consumption to provide adequate nutrient density. Um, so I've been a dietitian for, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm going to give a hint as to my age here, but <laughs> I've been a dietitian for close to 20 years. And I will say I have looked at a lot of food logs in my lifetime. I have talked with a lot of people about what their diet looks like. And I will say the one thing that I, the one comment that I can make to almost every single person I, um, you know, have worked with or have, have, um, you know, talked with about nutrition is it that they can increase fruits and vegetables in their diet. I, I could say that about my own diet. It's it's something that you really can't get enough of. Um, I've never looked at a food log and been like, oh, wow, you eat too many fruits and vegetables. That that really just doesn't exist in, in our, um, you know, American diet or really anywhere. So, you can always do yourself a favor by eating more fruits and vegetables. And if you walk away from this, this webinar, this presentation, and you only hear one thing, this is the one thing that I'd like you to hear. Fruits and vegetables um, are just so packed with nutrients um, for immune health, but obviously it goes far beyond that. Cancer um, prevention, you know, heart, heart disease, stroke risk, all those things. So. Um, three to five servings a day of vegetables, um, you know, make them as, as colorful as possible, make them as much variety as possible. I realize it's winter, but we do live in a, in a place where you can really get anything at any time. So, um, you know, have a big salad at lunch, have two vegetables with your dinner. Um, you know, uh, if you have eggs in the morning, put vegetables in your eggs, cut up some vegetables. If you have smoothie in the morning or during the day at some point, throw a couple handfuls of spinach in your smoothie. You won't even taste the spinach. Trust me, this is coming from somebody that doesn't like vegetables, but that has found all sorts of ways to eat them by disguising them. Um, 
so so yeah and then three uh, same thing with fruits three to five servings of fruit per day um you know the fruits are generally easier for people they're a little bit more handy they don't take as much work in terms of preparation um have them for snacks have that smoothie for breakfast in the morning um you know have them with your meals so so all all good there so eat your fruits and vegetables that will definitely help you stay <laughs> stay healthier um, okay, match energy intake to expenditure. So like we talked about, one of the major risk factors for upper respiratory infection is low energy availability. Um, when you're trying to lose weight, you should, you know, you, obviously there's a lot of reasons to avoid large calorie deficits when you're trying to lose weight, um, but immune health is one of those. So 200 to 400 calories per day as a deficit is, is reasonable. Um, and maybe if you're, you know, a large male with a ton of training, so your calorie needs are very high, up to 500 calorie per day deficit is reasonable. Um, but for the most part, anything beyond that is just too much of a cut. Um, it's really difficult for weight loss as well, but in terms of it, immune health, it, it's pretty, um, it's pretty significant. So, Avoid large calorie deficits um, when you're trying to lose weight or just, you know, in general, make sure that you're eating enough to support the training and your immune health day to day. Um, consume greater than 50% of daily energy intake as carbohydrate. Um, carbohydrate restriction may increase the immunosuppressive stress hormone response to exercise. Um, so you want to make sure that you're, you're getting enough carbohydrate in your diet for the most part if you're fueling your workouts with you know gels and sports drinks you're doing your recovery drink you're doing your you know pre-workout fueling um you know you'll get the carbohydrate in but you know just for anybody who's really restricting carbohydrate any any keto diet <laughs> dieters out there that type of thing that's pretty hard on your um, immuno system so just be careful with that um, and then ensure adequate protein intake. And that's about 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram. So to get your, your weight in kil kilograms, take your body weight in pounds, divide it by 2.2, that's your weight in kilograms, um, and then multiply that by 1.2 to 1.6 grams. Um, and that's how many grams of protein you need a day. So um, make sure you're getting adequate protein. Um, most you know, in my experience, most men are relative, and I'm making, obviously making big generalizations, but most men are relatively good at meeting their protein needs. Most women are not. I'm speaking in general for athletes. Athletes' protein needs are higher. Um, your protein needs are even higher if you're trying to lose weight and you are creating some sort of calorie deficit in your diet. So just be careful there. Make sure you're getting enough. Um, best most well i should say most efficient way to get um uh protein lean meats poultry fish um low fat dairy is a very good um a very good method of protein intake um obviously beans legumes not things like that are are relatively high in protein as well um so so just kind of kind of watch watch out for that stuff um okay so let's that's kind of the general stuff. Make sure you're eating your fruits and vegetables. Make sure you're, you're taking in enough in terms of calories, carbohydrate, and protein to support your training. Um, now let's switch modes a little and talk about some nutritional supplements. Um, I always tell people I'm not a big supplement person, but <laughs> I then go on to say, oh, but I think, you know, this supplement can be good and this one can, can be good. So um, this is an interesting, putting this presentation together was, is very interesting for me. I, I really delved into the research to kind of figure out what, what, if we're gonna, if we're gonna break this down and we're only gonna list a few supplements that can be helpful, what should those handful of supplements be? So these are the four that I really feel have the best support. Um, and we'll talk about them and why and what you need to do to, to take them and things like that. Okay, so zinc acetate lozenges. These are like, if you've ever seen cold ease is the, like the one that I immediately think of. Um, there's, I'm sure there's tons of brands out there. So um, basically they must be taken less than 24 hours after onset of a cold. 
So let's say you've had a cold for three days. These aren't going to be helpful. <laughs> you want to you want to start taking zinc lozenges as soon as you even feel the inkling of I think I'm getting sick. And we often know that, like, uh, I think I'm getting sick. Or if you're like me, you're like, oh, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe. And then oftentimes I don't get sick, but I will start taking this stuff. Um, so what does zinc do? It basically, you're still going to get sick, but it reduces the duration of the symptoms by about a day. Um, which, I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're sick, if you would be sick one less day, I mean, you'd be pretty happy about that. So so definitely worth it in that sense. Um, here's the thing though, you need about 75 milligrams a day. Um, most lozenges that are available at, you know, Rite Aid, uh, CVS, you know, over-the-counter uh, pharmacies only have about seven to 13 milligrams per lozenge. Therefore, you're looking at taking like six to 10 per day. So that's one mistake I see. People get the zinc lozenges and then they only have one or two. Um, you, you need that 75 milligrams a day. Um, it must be taken in lozenge form. So you can't just take a zinc supplement like a pill. It's actually, you need the lozenge form. So it's, it's the, 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 um, what's, ha what's going on in your mouth basically that is creating that immuno, uh, immuno benefit. Um, possible side effects. I don't think they taste great. Sometimes they cause nausea, especially if you're taking 10, 10 lozenges a day. Um, so just be, be wary of that. Um, and so again, this is, you know, as soon as you start feeling sick, start taking them, make sure you're getting the adequate amounts. And, you know, the benefit of doing this is potentially reducing the duration of your symptoms. Okay. So you're still going to get sick, but you won't be as sick for as long. Okay, so that's zinc, pretty strong support for zinc lozenges. Um, next one is probiotics. Um, probiotics, on, um, you, what, are, what kind of amount are we looking at? We're looking at 10 to the 10, so that's an extremely large number. 10 billion is that, is that number, um, live bacteria per day. So again, make sure when you're looking at these supplements that you're getting something that's actually adequate. You're taking an adequate amount. Um, the the benefit here is not just so there is possibly a reduction in the duration of symptoms up to two days, which is great. I mean, that would be fantastic if you were less if you got sick, but you were sick two days less than you were going to be. But also about a 50 percent reduction in um, in even incidents altogether. So that's 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 quite astounding to me. That's 50% reduction in getting sick. And then if you are, if you do get sick, a reduction in the symptoms by two days. Um, who should take these basically? Um, most, you most, especially if you're illness prone, you know, there's some people that just it's always seem to be sick. So you during high risk periods, so intense training, like you're really training hard, you're racing a ton, there's a ton of stress on your body from training. Um, this time of year, winter or cold flu season, or travel, um, you know, you, you know, you're going to be flying, that type of thing. Um, a lot of stress going on in your life, like really bad stretches of sleep, that type of thing. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of reasons to take probiotics for, you know, various other reasons, but in terms of supporting immune health, these are some times that you might want to take them if you're not, if you're not currently already taking them anyway. Um, and they, how do they work? Basically, they improve immune resistance by reinforcing the intestinal barrier. I think everybody knows that probiotics are basically like healthy gut bacteria. So it's good, good bacteria um, that, you know, lives in your gut. Um, so basically it improves your immune resistance by reinforcing the intestinal barrier and competing with pathogens for both attachment to the gut epithelium and also for available nutrients. So basically these good bacteria kind of push out or starve bad bacteria. And that's how it's, you know, perceived to work as, as a, an immu immune agent. Um, just as an example, um, you know, people often ask, okay, well, what should I get? Like what brand, what kind? Um, Clean makes a very good probiotic. 
it has 15 billion um, live bacteria per capsule. So it meets the, the you know, kind of standard of what we're looking for. Um, and the best part about clean products is they're all NSF certified. So very good for athletes. <clears throat> you know, you're getting a good product. Um, okay, so that was, that was probiotics. Now we're moving on to the next one, vitamin D, one of my favorites. I'm kind of a fan of vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids for different reasons, but those are my two faves. Um, so vitamin D, um, basically, it's funny, we used to think vitamin D was for, you know, it was for bone health and, you know, so you wouldn't get rickets. Uh, does anybody even know what rickets is anymore? Obviously, it hasn't been, been a problem in the U.S. for a long time, but um, vitamin D now is kind of the super, super vitamin that we're just finding has a ton um, of other roles in our health. And immune health is one of the big roles it plays. Um, so vitamin D deficiency has been associated with increased risk of, of upper respiratory infection. Um, and um, it, it influences several as aspects of immunity, the expression of antimicrobial proteins. It's just, it's kind of involved in immunity in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, a lot of athletes are, are, um, it, there's a ton of evidence that a lot of athletes are deficient. So, so this is something, um, that I, I often ec re recommend, end up recommending to athletes. Um, skin exposure to sunlight accounts for 90% of the annual, our annual source of vitamin D. So, so in the summer, when you're out in the sun, riding your bike or running all the time, or if you're lucky enough to have an outdoor pool and you're swimming all the time outdoors, you're pretty good to go. But the problem is, is in the winter months, not a ton of sunlight, we're not outside a ton, um, and so we become deficient. Um, the recommended dose for immune health is 1,000 IUs per day um, from fall to spring. So basically, again, when, if, if you're somewhere where you never get outside, then yes, year round. But for most people, from fall to spring is adequate, um, unless if you've had a deficiency, uh, you know, like a confirmed deficiency during the summer or something like that, where you'd want to take it all the time. But for most people, from fall to spring is sufficient. Um, to avoid insufficiency during those, you know, sunless <laughs> months. Um, clean clean um, also makes a vitamin D supplement. It's called Clean D. It's actually 5,000 IUs per tablet. So good to go there with that one. Um, okay, next, vitamin C. Um, so vitamin C is one of those that it's like, oh, wow, everybody, you always, when you were sick, your mom told you to drink orange juice, and you know she was she was right on about that. Um, not a high enough dose of vitamin C, but nonetheless on the right track with that. Mom was so. Um, <laughs> vitamin C is a powerful antioxidant um, that is a scavenger of, re of reactive oxidative species. Um, it reduces oxidative stress with infection and also during heavy exercise. Um, so it's one of those antioxidants very potent antioxidant. The problem here is, is, you know, there's a lot of um, questioning around if regular high dose vitamin C supplementation actually blunts some of the adaptations to endurance training. So it's the same way with a lot of the antioxidants that we know of. Um, you know, um, inflammation is actually a good thing in training. We want it. We just don't want too much of it. <laughs> so it's kind of, we want stress. We just don't want too much of it. You know, you, so there's kind of always this back and forth about, oh, well, do we want to supplement all the time with things like vitamin C or tart cherry, or does that actually blunt the response that we're trying to get from endurance training? So all of that aside, what we do know is um, is that um, there's a 50, about a 50% decrease in upper respiratory incidence when taking vitamin C. And we're talking about high doses. So we're talking about 0 0.25, so 250 to 1,000 milligrams, or 0 0.25 to 1 gram per day. Um, just to give you an idea, the reference is daily intake for vitamin C. So what we're supposed to have each day is only 75 milligrams for, for females and 90 milligrams for, for males. So we're talking obviously much higher doses for these supplements. 
Um, so, you know, probably not something to supplement all the time with, especially if you have, you know, high, high intake of fruits and vegetables in your diet. But if you feel like you're getting sick, um, if you feel like that upper respiratory is coming on, um, high doses, so like we're, again, we're talking one gram, um, likely required if initiating vitamin C supplementation after onset of upper respiratory infection to compensate for increased inflammatory response. And that will reduce the duration of the, um, of the infection. So vitamin C is a little, mm, you know, maybe not all the time high doses, but high doses when you feel um, when the high risk periods and when you feel like you are getting sick. Um, so, so basically here again, recommended to take 0 0.5, uh, to five to one gram per day during high risk periods. So again, travel, heavy stress, a lot of training, racing, cold and flu season, um, and, or to take one gram per day after onset of, you know, your symptoms to reduce the duration. Um, and then again, um, clean makes a vitamin C supplement. It's called clean C. It has 525 milligrams. Um, of vitamin C per chewable tablet. So if you feel sick coming on, you take two tablets a day. Um, um, otherwise, you might just take, you know, one tablet during those high risk periods. Um, and so just, just uh, I've mentioned a lot of clean supplements. So just as for a 15% off code, there's a code there for 15% off. Um, if you don't already have that, that um, basically you go onto their website, you create an account, and then you can use that code at checkout to get to get some discounts. Okay, so that's kind of my spiel about general nutrition and about um, you know supplements. How about training? Uh, what can we do training wise? So you know you have to be smart about the the training stress that you're 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 um, putting on yourself. I'll, um, and if you have you know, if you're coached by us, you know, the periodized, periodized training program, that's, that's what we do. So you're, you know, you know, you're safe in that sense. Um, but you, you may have to make sure you follow a proper training program that allows for recovery weeks after every two to four week build. Um, so you don't just continue to build, 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 build. You have to have build in those recovery weeks, basically take one step back to take two steps forward type of thing. Um, so ha just following a proper training program that has built-in rest is, um, or recovery weeks is super important. Um, you know, again, just simple training principles. Keep volume and intensity increases limited to 5 to 10% per week. So don't, you know, don't train for 10 hours one week and then the next week train for, you know, 25. That's obviously <laughs> too big of a jump and it puts your body at a huge amount of st stress especially during the winter months, again, when it's, it's a very high risk period. Um, and definitely schedule recovery days and actually ensure that these days are truly easy. Um, and that's what heart rate training is good for. Heart rate training won't lie to you. If your body is stressed for any reason, whether it is, <laughs> um, it is life stress, you're about to get sick, training stress, you know, that type of stuff, your heart rate will be higher. And so you'll, you'll be forced to slow down to, to basically compensate for that. And that is a very good thing because, um, you know, training, you know, our body doesn't just um, react to training stress, it reacts to all the stressors in our life. Um, so make sure you have those recovery days. Um, following high intensity sessions or high intensity days, and make sure those recovery days are actually easy. That's one of the biggest mistakes I see. People always pushing their recovery days. Oh, well, I mean, it feels easy, so it's probably good. When, in fact, um, it's, it's, you know, kind of a little bit too hard to actually recover. Um, so being stupid slow, stupid easy on those recovery days makes a big difference. Um, and then lifestyle strategy. So, you know, what can we do? Um, in terms of just life <laughs> in general, um, aim for greater than seven hours of sleep each night. And this is a little different for everybody. That's kind of a minimum. The minimum for some people is, is much higher than that. So a lot of people know, you know, I'm somebody that needs like nine hours of sleep at night. I mean, that seems, that seems like how would you find nine hours <laughs> to sleep in a day? But um, 
that's honestly what some people need to do to stay healthy and recovered and to make forward progress. Um, one thing is, is you can't catch up to multiple bouts of restricted sleep. So if you, you know, only sleep four hours a night for, you know, three or four days in a row, there's no catching up from that. If you sleep 10 hours the next night, that's not like, that's not going to help. Um, so consistency with sleep is king. Um, and, you know, if you find yourself with the ability to actually take a nap during the day, that's hugely beneficial as well. So take that opportunity. Um, <laughs> keep life psychological stress to a minimum. That's a little easier said than done for a lot of us. Um, but, you know, in a sense, if life is really stressful, there's a lot going on, it may mean that you have to reduce your training stress during period, these periods of high life stress, a lot of travel, work is crazy, family craziness is going on, um, to manage your overall stress load. Um, so, you know, you've all probably heard of the stress bucket, which, uh, Jesse, who started QT2, kind of always, you know, talks about. Um, think of your stress as, as you know, being in a bucket, you, you have this one bucket to fill. If you're, if you fill your bucket with a ton of life stress, work, you know, uh, family stuff, all that stress, well, then you only have a little bit of room left for training stress. You can't also, you know, pal in the training stress because then you're totally overflowed and that's when you end up getting sick or hurt or whatever. Um, if you have very minimal life stress, life is good, not so much is going on, all your bills are paid, you're good to go, then you have some more room to put in that training stress. So just kind of think of that always when it comes to, um, to the, you know, your stress bucket. Keep, keep that thing from overflowing um, and you'll, you'll, you're less likely to get sick. Um, and then, you know, avoid sick people. So you could just, you know, tuck yourself away at home with your dog like I do. Um, or, you know, when you are exposed to people with upper respiratory, which that's, that's pretty, um, you know, that's, that's a lot of people right now because of this, the, the time of year it is. Um, so when you are exposed or, you know, you have no way, like if you work in retail or you're a school teacher or something like that. Um, do not underestimate the importance of thoroughly washing your hands. I worked in a, um, in a hospital for years and years. I was a clinical dietitian for years and years and years. And obviously that is the max exposure to sick people. Um, so, you know, my hands were, you know, literally raw often because I, you wash your hands so much. So don't underestimate the importance of that. So wash your hands all the time. Um, in order to avoid self-inoculation, um, don't touch, if you are in contact with people and you can't get your hands washed, do not touch your eyes, your nose, your mouth, things like that. That's where the infection, upper respiratory infections come in. Um, so just be cognizant of that. And then um, if you do get sick, do not train with below the neck symptoms. Um, if it's, a, it's above the neck, you're a little safer to keep it, keep it light, but still do some training. If you have below the neck symptoms, you need to cut yourself off. Um, so that is it. That is, that is my, my keys to staying healthy during this time, um, or any time that is, uh, that is, uh, a high risk time for you. Um, I see I have some questions, so I am going to answer those. Let's see. Um, is it okay to take probiotics daily, even if you're not sick? Yeah, absolutely. Probiotics have a ton of benefits other than immune health. So um, it is definitely a supplement that for multiple reasons could be very good to take all the time. If you're somebody that's like, I'm not going to take these all the time, um, then, then I would just take them during periods of high stress like we talked about. But yes, absolutely. It's something that, um, that you can take all the time. Yep. Um, and then another question is, is I take vitamin D, but do you think we need it living in Florida? Hmm. That is a good question. Um, you know, definitely people that live in, in areas where there's not as much sun, um, Northern hemispheres, that type of thing, they are at much higher risk than people that live in places like Florida, where there's a lot more sun and you get out a lot more often and things like that. 
you could still possibly need it. Um, you're definitely, you know, you're, you're definitely at risk for other reasons. You know, it's so cold, cold and flu season in Florida, but you're probably less likely to need it than somebody that lives in, you know, let's say, um, you know, well, Massachusetts, <laughs> for example, like myself. So, um, the one thing you could do if you're not really sure is you could get a vitamin D level checked in the winter months um, and just kind of see where you're at. If you're low, then you know, okay, well, maybe I do need it. I do need to supplement. Um, if, you're, if your levels are good, even in the winter months, then you're probably safe, you know, that you don't need to take it. Uh, next question is, is vitamin D fat or water soluble? In other words, can you overdo it? Um, it is fat soluble. It is one of the fat soluble vitamins. Um, but nonetheless, you really can't overdo it. If you stick to a dose like 5,000 IUs a day, you're good. Don't worry about it. Um, there are some super doses like 20,000 20, IUs. Like sometimes, um, you know, one way to bring somebody up to if they're found deficient, we used to give these high doses of vitamin D, like that could potentially be a little harmful, but it's something that you can get over the counter, like 5,000 IUs a day, you will be fine. Um, I, it's not, it is fat soluble, but it's not, you're, you're not worried about overdoing it there. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? concerns. Um, it's funny. I don't actually have my email <laughs> on this slide. I should have my email on this slide, or do I? No, I don't. Um, so I am just Beth at thecorediet.com. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out um, and uh, or any follow-up uh, concerns or anything like that. And um, yeah. We can go from there. I thank you all for joining me and uh, I will talk to you all soon.